Hey, Michael, welcome to the show. Is way of getting started. Tell us about yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I am uh, located in the Bay Area. I'm the director of revenue performance here uh, at Chili Piper. Um, I've worked in pretty much every role in sales, starting as an SDR and account executive, uh, and then uh, moved into leadership pr pretty quickly after that and have really enjoyed the profession and, and working alongside great salespeople and sales leaders um, all across the U.S. How have you found it being a leader versus a rep? Um, stark similarities and stark differences. <laughs> um, I think that uh, driving key outcomes is one thing that is a constant in both roles. Um, how I might do that is a little bit different, um, but, but being a driver of outcomes is something that has been an important theme, whether I was an SDR doing top line, an AE, like constantly trying to drive um, net new revenue or a sales leader who's driving outcomes across teams of people um, or even things like implementing new products that you know will be essential in helping your team uh, perform. So I've I found that, you know, that characteristic be really um, important. I've enjoyed all of those different roles. Um, the, the thing I like particularly about leadership is um, I get to help other people and also I get to see um, and learn constantly. I think sometimes like people like look at leaders or at least I did when I was a brand new SDR is like having all the answers. But um, I, I think I learn way more uh, now than, you know, than perhaps I did a, as an SDR, which has been really awesome for, for me personally. And uh, I, I try to instill that in our culture here at Chili Piper. Cool. And how about your training program? Have you come up with something that works for you? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I call it the five cornerstones of uh, world-class sales training. Um, and we basically uh, really put an emphasis on, on growth. I know that's something that, that people like to, to talk about. It's something that um, is one of the key drivers of recruiting and retaining top talent. Um, we, we've had a really phenomenal um, uh, retention rate here at Chili Piper, and I attribute much of that to our ability to hire, uh, lead, and, and, re and train um, and coach our revenue facing team. So our, our SDRs, our account executives, and our account managers is what I pr primarily work with. Um, and all of that is rooted in training. So the five cornerstones of world-class sales training um, uh, is, is what I call it. Happy to walk through those if that's helpful for you. Yeah, well, let's start with number one. It's probably usually the most important one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, the first one, uh, uh, the first step number one is uh, micro learning or an emphasis on micro learning. So um, the way that we do it here at Chili Piper is we introduce concepts. Uh, basically, you can kind of think of it in chunks or in almost like sound bites where we'll craft material um, on a content basis. And we have all of the SDRs, AEs and uh, account managers in on these these trainings so it's something that can be applicable to everyone so we might introduce new concepts um, that are clustered together from a book that we recently read it might be something that's not in a book that we just um, as a part of our sales process that we know is key to driving the outcomes that we want we really use micro learning and chunking these things down um, so that it's super digestible um, and also something that is tangible that someone can then take back to the call um, and really focus on that one thing before they move on to the next skill item. And for us, it's made all the world of difference um, to that. So um, I'll give an example. One of the books that we had the team read recently is uh, Never Split the Difference, a super popular book in the uh, sales world. Um, and I'll get to this in one of the future steps, but I worked with one of our, um, our account managers to actually produce uh, the, the content from that book and share it with the sales team. Um, he did a phenomenal do a job with that production. One of the concepts we really focused on was getting to know, and then we had the whole team focus on that one concept um, sort of repeatedly out of that book, and then we moved on to the other concepts. So this whole concept of micro learning or breaking it down into chunks has been uh, a really great uh, learning methodology for our team. And how often do you give a chunk? Is it once a week, once every two weeks? 
Yeah, so it depends. We, we might even have a couple of different pieces of information in one training. Typically, it's just focusing on one piece of information every week. Um, if it's fairly digestible, we might do like two to three in one training. Um, it's not in any set like format, but we do break it down um, into concepts. Um, so I'd say anywhere from like one to three uh, every week. And it doesn't mean that we're necessarily introducing new concepts every week, but um, you know, maybe we want to spend a little bit more time on the concept in the following week training, but we do have a weekly cadence um, of training set up, even if that training is meant to reinforce the previous week. Um, so I'd say anywhere we, between one and three. And is it like in a conference room where you talk about it or uh, do you have quizzes or how do you know it's retained? That's a really great, um, that's a really great question. So, um, that actually brings me to the point too. So our entire team is, um, and the whole company is entirely distributed. Um, we don't have a centralized HQ like most companies do. Um, so we're, we're all distributed. So we work off of zoom primarily. Um, and so all of our trainings are over Zoom where everybody hops on together. The second point in the five corner sins, though, is follow up and reinforcement. And so um, it's, it's one thing to introduce to, uh, a concept to someone, but very rarely can someone just retain that and then begin applying it like immediately. So we really focus on introducing the new concept and then not letting it fall through the cracks where so often when, when learning in general for any role happens, it's introduced and it kind of goes in one ear and out the other. I recognize that in my own career and working with, you know, people when I was a, a brand new manager. So we try to instill things uh, to prevent that from happening. So we'll do things like follow-ups in our one-on-ones. We'll do um, segmented out groups that are smaller than compared to that like larger training. Uh, people will use a sales enablement tools to uh, submit calls proving that they've like learned the concept. There's a whole bunch of different things that, that we do to really like focus on follow-up and reinforcement of it. And it's not in a punitive or like even like an accountability way. It's just that that enforcement that the, that the skill is um, has been learned and it's just a cadence that we build into um, how we learn as a team. Um, and, and I've gotten really tremendous feedback from it uh, there. And so you encourage or you require the team to come up with the the micro lesson yeah so um actually the the third point that i um in the five corner sins um is a diffuse sort of leadership structure yeah. so um i think oftentimes uh, at least um, in my own career a lot of the training was coming from like one individual and I think that can be useful, um, especially if one person is ultimately responsible for it and driving those outcomes. I think that is important. But it, I think when it comes from introducing, presenting, different takes, like people learn in fundamentally different ways. And I think getting different perspectives or, or even like different voices will help people like retain that information better. And so we have a, a diffuse leadership structure, both in the content presentation and the content development. Um, and then this diffuse structure enables for a more, uh, for it to be more embedded into our culture as a sales team. And so it's not, it's not just top down, like, oh, you need to do this. This is, you know, how, how we do things here, but rather um, making it institutionalized where everyone in the company is super, uh, driven by um, by the concept of growing and learning um, and then what happens as a result is when you're not around they end up kind of helping each other and it sets up this really cool dynamic so um, that's the third point is the, the diffuse leadership structure and do you also do the classic like two-day workshop at kickoff or or this is your training process yeah, so because we uh, because we're remote, we don't have the traditional SKOs like most companies do. We do have uh, company um, offsites. We just took our company in October to Ibiza, uh, so we all do get to hang out and spend FaceTime with each other. We just do that a little bit differently. Um, throughout the year, uh, we we don't have any sort of like formalized like structure like that, like a lot of companies do, where it's like an uh, an offsite for two days, but we replaced it with these these trips. We've done Paris in the in the past, and we're working towards another one um, right now. Uh, right now, 
Um, and so uh, this type of structure where we do it weekly tends to, um, tends to serve us well in terms of uh, how we approach training in general. And so it is kind of the team driven uh, versus picking like a particular compounding, like let's take something simple, like uh, getting to know or questioning or handling objections or understanding what the other person is saying and meaning. Um, yeah, so I mean, sometimes it will, sometimes the person presenting will be myself or the CEO, and um, it will be on a topic that may be something that we, we noticed. Um, my point with that is that it's not on, only us presenting, it's not only us coming up with content. For sure, though, if I, if I see that um, the basics, for example, I spent a good six months chunk of time really focusing um, on on the basics of discovery, uh, how to demo properly, like next steps, things like that. Um, uh, and, and the deviation comes from uh, the degree of learning I saw from peer, the peer to peer, as well as getting feedback. So it's not just one form, but it's employing uh, several different forms of uh, communication, both from uh, leadership at, at the manager, um, level and C-suite, and then also the peer-to-peer -peer learning as well, which encompasses sales process um, as well. Um, and it's really born out of the idea of focusing not just on the what. So I think sometimes in sales organization, it's like we need to hit our quotas. We need to we need to focus on these outcomes, and it's like the what. And I pivoted a lot more to focusing the what is important, but also focusing on like, how do you actually do it? Like, how do you put together a cadence? How do I, when I get this specific objection, like how do I, how do I deal with that? Um, or if, if uh, I, I literally have seen salespeople who had a very, very tough time running simple discovery in one month and zero revenue on the board to the, to the next month being one of the top performers because of tweaks there. And a lot of that is because of the coachability of the sales rep, but also like how that person is being led, taught and trained is, is really important too. And how do you determine like during the interview process that the person's gonna be open to this versus the know-it-alls or the, uh, mm -hmm. I know what I'm doing, leave me alone types? Yeah, I usually can tell by someone. So um, I, I wrote an article about this a while back. I'm like, it, it's called Five Reasons Why I Didn't Hire You. And <laughs> point. Uh, you like the five, huh? <laughs> I do. It's my favorite number. Um, <laughs> so maybe it was four reasons. Um, but the, the the first was um, we conduct, I conduct a role play basically with them. Um, and you can tell a lot by asking someone to do a role play and then uh, giving feedback and asking them to do it again. Um, is it, you know, fail proof? I don't think any hiring strategy is fail, fail proof, um, but it's a, a big step in the right direction away from gut check strategies of hiring of, oh, I think this person or, oh, I feel this person will be good at this, but rather we put them in the closest situations that we can to what they'll be doing on an actual day to day and then we see how they respond in those situations. For example, uh, one of the most, co the most common response I get from people after I ask them to do a role play in an interview is, oh, I could have done better if I only knew more about the product. And I think that's like a very kind of negative way to review uh, yourself for that situation. A growth mindset would be like, oh, I could have done this better, whether it's tonality or, asking better questions or uncovering uh, a deeper reason for someone to take a meeting before you set it up. There's a whole plethora of things that usually we could all improve, improve upon my, myself included if I did the exercise. And so I'm, I'm really looking for that person who is truly hungry uh, to grow. There is a baseline of, you know, sales acumen and being able to, you know, uh, talk their way you know, through basic maybe objections uh, or, or, or just like a basic uh, framework of understanding like a, a cold call or, or a discovery call. But that, that's one exercise of several that we do, but it's basically trying to be more in the direction of empiricism, less in the direction of gut, gut check. Yeah, no, that's good. Uh, what's number four on the training? 
Yeah, so number four is relevance. And so um, so we, we place a higher emphasis of relevance over theory. And so this is using um, like real calls, real situations. So I might present a, a, a concept that's really important uh, for, for people to learn, but it's never just theory. It's never just philosophy. It's always the practical application that will, um, again, show how maybe a situation could have been better or improved or where someone did a really good job. Um, but it's always connecting the dots between, you know, what we're actually uh, learning and what's happening on the phones. And I think that piece is fundamentally crucial. It's always the first thing I do when I go into um, an organization as a new leader and it's the outcome that I, or, or the thing that I do that I think is the most important to driving the outcomes that we want. Um, and I think so much of it provides um, insights into what, uh, what's actually happening on the phone. So uh, yeah, the real focus on, on relevance. And how do you do that? Case study based? Um, so a lot of it, um, you, you could say it's a, a case study format. A lot of it is through, uh, for example, on the first concept, if we're, if we're learning about a specific uh, piece of micro content, and I will show example, it's from either um, outside of the company or inside of the company are real examples where that has well, been done really well um, to, to connect the concept to how they would actually practically do it. Um, so an example um, to use Never Split the Difference again, if you're getting to know, we connected how getting, uh, getting to a no through uh, emailing at Chili Piper is like very relevant to their actual job. So I we connect the dots for people. It's not just, oh, go read this book and okay, you're done. It's how does this exactly play out to um, your actual job here as someone who is prospecting every day um, or who is uh, closing new deals every day. And, and for me, connecting the dots has been super important to, um, to driving the learning outcomes for the team. Yeah. And are you finding like building their judgment skills about um, how to handle a particular situation? That's such a good question. I found that over time they become self-sufficient, which uh, is ultimately the goal of any leader. If you know, you had a self-sufficient sales team, um, but they, they establish self-sufficiency which is like beyond expertise for me and, and being able to do it themselves in a motivated way and then turn around and be able to teach that to other people too. That's, that's like the real, you know, where the real love of this concept comes from is because then it, again, it creates a culture, they're self-sufficient um, and it just has only positive benefits from there. Yeah. Cool. And what's number five? Number five, the last one. So we always try to make it like very buyer focused. So even in these, um, in the replies, in the responses, the common thread um, of everything that we do is not uh, responding with like uh, a selfish response or something that's super like product driven, um, like five layer deeper, layers deeper, like most of our managers want. But one or two layers deeper, we would get so much better results than you know, I, I hear other, you know, leaders talking about this too. And people talk about this so much because we get on demo, you know, I've sat in on so many sales demos just this year of uh, evaluating products at other companies and still so, so much of them are done in this knee jerk reaction way where it's like, I have this problem. And then we're, um, we're immediately pitching. We're immediately telling about ourselves. You know, uh, on one demo, someone was giving us like the history of their company and like the slide. And like, it's just like, it sounds ridiculous, but these things are still happening all the time in 2020. And I think if we just pause and think, you know, how can we, how can we learn a little bit deeper about what the underlying motivations are of that particular per, uh, person, we might get some of the results that, that we're looking for if we make all of our answers and our questions more buyer focused. So that's the, that's the fifth cornerstone. Yeah. I mean, if you can do that, that's really the hardest getting people out of their own head. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. And, and trying to think like a client, what, I, what yeah. I call the outward mindset. Yeah. That's a really, it's really hard for people to do that and, and take themselves out of their own shoes. But I noticed a trend with like uh, managers 
as soon as like someone was put in a like a different type of role they were understanding concepts that i was trying to teach them when they were um like maybe a sales rep so what i started doing is i would put prospecting emails that i get in front of the sales team to make them think about it and then they had all the answers and then and then when they were able to have the awareness around other people then they could have awareness around themselves um, and that was a little bit of a, that was one specific strategy I deployed it because it's really hard for you to just automatically get that third party perspective when you're, it's your job to sell. And so if I put them in a little bit of a different situation, it's like, okay, this is what it looks like for me. Or I would take a snippet of a call, a call of a real demo I was on at another company and like show them that. And then they they immediately they just get the concept that I had been trying to teach them for three months so much, you know, instantly. And it's like instantly conveyed. So yeah, I think that's such an interesting topic. Yeah. And I, I've always used the question, if you were them, what would you do? Yeah. Or what would you be concerned with? Why do you think it's stalling? Yeah. That's a great um, indirect question to get them thinking. Yeah. Because they're, 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 their inward mindset is worried about their job and their survival. Yeah. And that blinds them from what's the other person is thinking. Yeah. And I think sometimes like, you know, like they're incentivized very heavily to close revenue. So they shoot to the outcome too. Right. When if we slow it down a little bit and like, okay, well, how do we, yes, that's the goal, but there's like little, a bunch of, there's a million little things that we need to do before we just, okay, are you ready to move forward? Um, and I think it, sometimes if we can slow it down a little bit, and you know, take a deep breath. We will we'll actually get those outcomes in a, and, in a better way. And how do you kind of handle? Um, you get the what to do, but how do you do it? You know, email's easy. You write it. It's mm -hmm. you can see it. But on the phone, there's tonality. There's pausing. There's questions, pacing, leading. Yeah, it's tough. Um, I've actually found recently that on the email topic, people, it not being as simple as I think like we have assumed in the past, for example, a lot of companies have some sort of cadence technology that automates the emails. What isn't automated is the next email when the person actually replies. And I think if sales managers take a second and go look at some of those emails, um, you'd be, you'd be, maybe pleasantly surprised, but my guess is a little bit in the other direction of, of type of surprise because, um, you know, you never hear about the concept of like email coaching and like, what do you do when someone replies? And I, I spent like two weeks on this with a team uh, where they would like get a reply. I would look at it. We would, I would help them craft responses. And then they were able to be again, like more self-sufficient than before. And that was something that really drove metrics there. So that was one thing through email that I think a lot of people miss. They just put people in cadences and, and like, Oh, the cadence will take care of it. And it's not that simple. Um, the other thing with, with, with calls is that is very, hard people you know most people already have call reluctance you know a fear of being rejected um i think uh, i place a lot of you know emphasis of people who are trying to to do well in that channel because i know it has gotten much harder um but it still is successful and still can be very successful for many companies um out there if done correctly and so i think just making making the concerted effort to coach people around um again this concept of like micro micro learning so for example if someone uh, had a, a cold call that maybe didn't go so well there's usually two things i'll do i'll either focus on the biggest room for improvement on the call and then focus on that for the next few days until it, they have that down and are able to do it sufficiently or I'll look at the call as a funnel and focus at the beginning of the call. Okay, let's just get the intro down. And I'm not, you know, I'm not even worried about the result. Like, you know, there's nothing punitive going on here. I just, I, I want it to be a learn, learning endeavor and we'll focus on the call as a funnel. So just getting the intro down. So I usually deploy like those strategy, strategies and I really normalize like failure. Like it's okay. Like we, you know, I failed so many times. You don't need a million yeses. You just need a certain number of yeses. And so, so much of that is through the process of continual 
improvement. And so I think we need to normalize that, especially with calls. Um, people tend to beat themselves up and just listening to them regularly. The last thing I'll say about all of this is that we, we have a scoring framework up. And if people don't have that, I gave a talk on, on just that one topic about eight months ago and I asked the room how many people are listening to their calls, how many people are scoring your calls. And there's hundreds of people in the room, one person raised their hand. So I think if you don't know what you're looking for as a leader, then how is a rep supposed to know what they're supposed to be doing? And if, 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 uh, if, if the rep is saying, if the manager is saying, oh, you need to hit your quota and the rep doesn't know how to do it, they should be able to feel comfortable enough to say, how do I, how can I do that? And can you help me get there? I said, I always wondered why people would count phone calls and not and spend zero time scoring them. Yeah. Right. <laughs> because an A call is very different than a B call. Exactly. Yeah. And is that how you do it? A, B or C or? Uh, so we have three cat we so, uh, we like the number five, but we like the number three more, uh, cause it keeps things very simple. <laughs> so we have three categories for SDR, AE and AM calls. And then, uh, we weight discovery portions of the call heavier. And then the, so we do one to five for non-discovery sections and one to 10 for, that's how we weight, we weight it. And it's worked really, um, really well for us in, in getting that weighted score with the emphasis on discovery. So we, we place a lot of emphasis there, but that's the way we do it. And, and do they mark it in the CRM or how do you do it? Uh, yeah, in the CRM. There, okay. we, we've created like custom fields in the CRM, and then that automates a report that's sent out to me daily, actually. Yeah. And do they rate themselves per day on how well they did that day? Yeah. Um, so we get a lot of our, uh, well, we place a big emphasis on the email, and we also have uh, some emphasis on calls for, for example, for the SDRs. And so their connected calls, they'll score all of them for that day. And then for the AEs and account managers, it's their um, discovery calls. Although we do have a separate framework set up for follow-up calls too, which is similar, but a little bit different. Yeah, and do you care about number of calls as much? So I used to be a manager that did. Uh, my views have evolved uh, significantly since like when I was like a sales rep. Um, I think a lot of people view it as like, you need to hit this number of calls and it's like very high. I don't think of it that way. I think of it more as like uh, compound interest. So like if you do the act, especially for AEs, if you do the act of prospecting every day, it will compound over time and really help you. So I'm not asking, you know, it's like going to the gym, like, you know, you're not going to go once and be ripped. You're not going to be, you know, read one, one book uh, and, and be super, you know, it's the consistent and concerted effort every single day. And so that's what I really encourage the team to do. So I focus less on like these huge numbers and then holding and managing people to the numbers um, because, you know, there are people that can be really successful and get these big accounts and be really successful through being more creative and through figuring out other ways in, in innovation, you know, uh, you don't always see it coming. So I think not managing that number has been good for us. What I, what it, for the SDRs, we have like a minimum, like you should be at least hitting this really, really low number. <laughs> and everyone is usually able to hit that. And it's a great way to get people ramped up and feeling confident and good that they're like hitting that number. If they're not, if like something's going wrong because that number is pretty low. Um, but generally people go um, above that. So the way I used to manage was it was a very high number and everyone had to reach that. I've really gotten away from that. And now it's like, hey, this is a low number. Work the way that you want. But I'm going to be looking, you know, as long as the results are there at the end. So the structure is much more habit based. Mm -hmm. And I, I love that word compounding because mm -hmm. that that's really my view on sales. It should be compounding instead yeah. of Groundhog Day, you know. Waking yeah. up every day to the same music, stepping exactly. in the same puddle. <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, when I was an account executive, I stopped prospecting like, oh, I got this. It just came off the best month ever. And then I was like, oh, my gosh, I have no pipeline. I have no pipeline. Right. <laughs> and right. You have a system. You do this yeah. on Monday. You do yeah. a minimum number of things, like showing yeah. up at nine, right? There's, yeah, exactly. There's a, a minimum structure. Exactly. 
Yeah. And, and usually people, I think, if you're hiring ambitious people who are self-starters and all those great things that we put in our job description, they will naturally want to, I, you know, I very rarely do I meet people that don't want to do a good job, you know, inherently. So I don't, you know, I, I think there's room to treat people more like adults in this area who like really want to own their own success. And I think, you know, sometimes in, in a lot of companies I see, we kind of handhold a little bit. And, and um, you know, sometimes people need that, but I think autonomy is important too. Yeah, great. Hey, there's been a great conversation. Where can people go to follow you and learn more about your work? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, LinkedIn is the best place to, to find me. Um, you can just search Michael Tuso. Um, yeah, that's the, the best way. You can also email me, michael at chilipiper.com.